Uh, so this is a breakdown of the movie Soul. I'm gonna go into the spiritual concepts, and metaphysics of the movie. Uh, and after this, I'm gonna have another video. I'm gonna drop the philosophy of the movie. But this is basically gonna deal with the spiritual, uh, metaphysical concepts that are in the movie. We're gonna lay it out thoroughly and we make it plain. So this is from the movie Soul. Okay, so the first thing we gotta do is we gotta acknowledge the characters. The first and main character is Joe. Now let me break down Joe. So let's see what he symbolizes in the spiritual world. Okay, Joe represents the angel named Joel. El means God or means power in the Hebrew language. And Joel or Yael or Yahuel is a angel or an archangel in the Hebrew uh, pantheon and in the Hebrew cosmology. But basically, it's symbolic in the Hebrew cosmology as generally the Christ figure. The Christ figure. We'll explain why. We'll make it plain, but what does the Christ figure mean? It means in all the different cultures, the Christ figure will be the angel Michael, right? It will be Metatron in the Enochian and the Kabbalistic uh, circles, Metatron. It will be Heru or Horus amongst the Egyptians, Krishna in India, and Apollo amongst the Phoenicians and Greeks and so on. So that's your Christ figure. That's what Joe in, in his movie represents. Joe represents the Christ figure or the chief particular angel in the pantheon of cosmology. Okay, now dealing with this angel Joel, if you read on his side, I put references, and they're gonna basically elaborate, break down the principles of this angel, and you'll see how that shows up in the movie. So Joel, the angel Joel, is known to be the choir master of heaven. Now, if you see the picture in the movie, I took a screenshot of the movie. These are scenes from the movie, and it shows Joe being a teacher uh, teaching these kids how to play all of the instruments. Well, remember, the angel Joel is the choir master of heaven. The school represents the, uh, the heaven or the spiritual world. Right off the gate, at the beginning of the movie, the school is symbolic as, as above, so below. Joel is that angel that presides over music, being a choir master for these angels, meaning what? These children. So you translate that into the movie, you'll see Joe is the teacher of the choir of children, these children being a cherubim or... Uh, divine beings and him being the choir master or the chief archangel over them. So he's the choir master of heaven. He's known as the celestial or heavenly choir master. These are different terms you can find in different texts and different books on the angel Joe or Joel. The angel Joel also governs heavenly singing. Joel is also known as Metatron amongst the Enochian and Kabbalistic circles or Kabbal Kabbalistic texts and the Enochian texts. Uh, Joel is also an archangel. There's seven major archangels. One of them, uh, typically in a lot of different texts, is known as Joel, right? Joe. So remember, this is the figure we're dealing with in the movie, the main character. And also, Joel is associated with Michael. He's also considered exchangeable or interchangeable with the angel Michael. Okay, so when you see the main character, Joe, playing the piano, we have to understand that's symbolic, that's parallel to the angels where they play the harp. The harp and the piano is one and the same. All pianos that made it their way into Europe come from harps from Africa or from Asia. They were originally harps or lyre, what's called lyres. Okay, so one thing people may not be familiar with is that the angels are highly known to preside over music. They're known to have choirs, they're known to sing all throughout the book of Psalms, all throughout the Bible. You'll read, it's hinted and it's scattered throughout the whole text and many other texts that these angelic beings are known to be divine singers. They chant mantras or divine songs. Uh, but a lot of them are known to have trumpets, a lot of them are known to have harps, and, all, and other type of instruments. So they're known to be these divine singers. But remember, that's a metaphor. It's not literal. It's metaphoric of consciousness. It's metaphoric of divine sound. And it's also a metaphor for sacred geometry, which is made by divine music and divine tones and sounds. So if you go deep into it, you'll understand how these angelic beings function with music. So go on with this Christ figure concept. Remember, hey, Ru. Uh, there's Yeshua or Jesus Christ and all of these other Christ figures, uh, Dionysus, you can go on and on and on. They're all known to have died and resurrected. It's called the, the death and resurrection myth or concept in many different ancient spiritual systems. Well, in the movie, you'll notice that Joe dies and resurrects, right? Just like Enoch does and just like the Christ does and just like all of these other Christ figures. The conclusion of what the character Joe is, he's the angel Joel, Metatron, or Michael or even the Christ figure itself, your own soul. Because that's what that metaphysical concept translates to, it's your own soul. Remember, the movie is called Soul. Okay, so now we're going to deal with all of the other characters. All of the other characters are going to be based on archetypes. Now, archetypes basically is a spiritual concept, a psychological and spiritual concept that comes out of Carl Jung and other advanced philosophers and writers. 
Now these archetypes, you can find them used in all ancient mystery systems and spiritual systems in the ancient world. So Egypt, Greece, Phoenicia, the Hebrew system, the Hindu system, all of them use these archetypes and translate prototypical personalities to humans, to animals, and to nature. They're called archetypes. So you have to understand Carl Jung is significant because Carl Jung was mentioned in the movie, right? He was mentioned in the movie as one of the tutors or one of the guides for 22, the angel 22. So who is 22, the angel 22? Let's deal with 22. 22 represents Sophia, the great mother or the goddess in the Gnostic and Christian system. 22 is Sophia. Sophia basically is a principal uh, entity or energy in a Gnostic and other spiritual and Christian uh, systems. Okay, so why does this angel that I'm saying is Sophia have the name 22? Why do they give it a name 22? Because you have to understand in the mythology, Sophia has 22 paths. She's called the 22 or the 22nd goddess, the goddess of 22. And there's 22 letters in that ancient alphabet. And if you read the reference I put on the page, it'll be able to make this thoroughly understood and prove the point. Sophia is associated with the 22 paths. They call the 22 paths of so Sophia. Okay, so on this diagram and this chart on the side of me, you'll see that it gives you the whole pantheon, the whole layout of the hierarchy in the Gnostic system. And you'll see at the very highest spheres, the second to the third highest sphere, it says Christ and Sophia. Well, that's Sophia, like I said, she has 22 paths of how she descends into the physical world and how she ascends back into the spiritual world. Well, the Christ, like I said, is Metatron, which will be the angel Joel. And Sophia is her partner or her other side, her other half, uh, at the very top of the uh, the chart. So understanding, if you go to Hinduism, the Egyptian system, they always have this these pair, a Shiva Shakti, a Purusha Prakiti, Krishna Radha. But in this sense, it's the Gnostic sense, it's Sophia and Joel, the angel Metatron or Joel. Those are the two. So remember, Sophia represents the 22 paths of Sophia, the 22 paths of ascension and descension. So let's keep moving. Okay, so who is the cat? The cat is a key figure in the movie, so it's got to be a key figure in the spiritual world if I'm going to be bringing this out. So the cat represents Bess, the, the god, the deity named Bess. You can see about him in ancient Egypt. Now, if you see the pictures I put on the side of me, you'll see how uh, Joe in the movie carries the cat on his shoulders. Well, you have to understand, in ancient uh, Egypt, there's depictions of uh, a being named Harkov the Consul or Consul which is a form of horse or Heru. Remember the Christ figure in Egypt, Heru. And you'll see Bess on his shoulders. You know what I'm saying? You'll see Bess carry right above his head and on his shoulders. It's the same symbology in the movie. Because remember, that cat is a key component of guiding you through the spiritual world and is a guardian and a protector. Well, it's the same way in ancient Egypt because Bess is also a guide into the spiritual world. He guides Horus and he's a protector of the child Horus or the soul. So it's the same thing in the movie, uh, Soul, with Joe and his cat. Okay, so who is Dorothea, the uh, sister playing the saxophone that uh, helps Joe join the group? Well, Dorothea would be the goddess Athena or Neith. We talked about her a few minutes ago. Athena or Neith, why? Athena is in the Greek, Neith is in the uh, Egyptian and lower uh, Kemet. Okay, so why Athena or Neith? Well, if you look to the side, you'll see a picture. I put a picture of Athena and you'll see clearly if you research this that she's associated with playing the flute or the flute. And remember, the flute presides over all wind instruments, all wind instruments, saxophone, trombone, all of that. So you have to understand the association with Athena and the flute to understand Dorothea. Now, what is that Dorothea? That Thea, Thea at the very end of Dora, Thea, the Thea, it means goddess or divine feminine principle or goddess. So Thea, I'll put the reference for that on the side and you'll see that. Theos or Dios a Zeus, Dios or Zeus, Theos means God, but Thea means goddess. You get it? So it's very simple. Dorothea means she associated with the goddess. The goddess who? Athena. And also, you, if you look up Athena's name and look at the etymology of her name, you'll see that Thea is in Athena's name. So that'll make it simple for you. Okay, so who is Curly, the guy who opens the door for Joe for him to be able to join a group? Who represents the door opener? which in, in ancient India would be the god Ganesh. Very simple. If you look at the picture I put on the side, you'll see in a movie there's clips how he plays that role of being a door opener and being a guard of the crossroads for you to be able to enter into higher spiritual worlds. That's Ganesh. Uh, but in ancient Egypt, that would be what Anubis or Ampu, Anubis. So that's who Curly is, Joe's uh, student that helped him be able to get 
uh, inside of the group and join the group with Dorothea. That's Ganesh, that's Ganesh or Anubis. Okay, so one more connection to make to prove that Curly is associated with uh, Ganesh is you have to understand Curly is one is the one who plays the drums. Well, if you study ancient Hindu mythology in the East or Dravidian and Tamil mythology, you'll understand that Ganesh plays the drums for the for the uh, band or for the choir of the gods, right? Ganesh. And, he, and remember, Ganesh is also the what the door opener, the guider, the one who uh, opens all the spiritual gates. Well, that's Curly in the movie. The one who plays the drums and the one who opens the spiritual gates. Very simple. Okay, now we're going to deal with a character called Moonwen. Moonwen. That was basically the hippie-like character. Well, Moonwen would be what? Tahuti or Hermes. Very key. And if you pay attention to the way he looks, they made him look almost like a crane, like a bird, and like in a mixture of like an ape or a baboon. Well, that's very simple. You know, he's very hairy. Well, we know that's how hippies are depicted, but you have to understand Moonwen is the principle of the influence of the moon. Well, Tahuti is the Lord that presides over that influence and the moon. You see the connection? And moon when it's critical in guiding Job through the spiritual world or the duat or the underworld throughout the movie, which is the subconscious. Tahuti has the knowledge to be able to open the gate and guide him to where he needs to go. Well, that's Tahuti in the spiritual mythology in ancient Egypt. Same thing with Hermes in the Phoenician and Greek mythology. So with that, moon when is Tahuti or Hermes. It's simple. Joe's mother, who would his mother represent? His mother would be uh, distinct figures in many different mythologies, but I'm going to say Aset or Isis, first of all. She's Akarat or Emet amongst the Hebrews and the Canaanites. It's a, it's a chief mother goddess that's named Akarat or Emet. And another name for her is Kokma, meaning wisdom or Kokma. That's a form of Sophia. There's a higher Sophia and a lower Sophia. Joe's mother would be that higher Sophia, uh, the expression of it. But basically, Atharat and Emet, why is that important? And Kokma, why, why are these female principles and deities important? Because Atharat, if you see the reference on the side, she is the goddess that presides over weaving and sewing. You can also see Bridget, Athena, uh, Neef, the goddess Neef. A lot of different principal goddesses around different cultures are associated with weaving and sewing, even Saraswati in India. So if I put it in a center where you have the biggest amount of reference for this, is you got to go look up Atharat. Or Emet. Her name is Emet or Alat. Alat. A L A T. And she's the wife of the highest primordial principal deity, El, or Allah, or El, whatever name you want to use, depending on your language. But that's who Joe's mother is. She is the great mother, the higher Sophia, called Kokma. Check. So let's move on. So who would be his father? His father that's dead. Remember, he's dead. He's never seen in a movie except in a memory. And he's in a hallway, a hall. Remember, that hall is the hall of judgment. That father that's in the hall that's guiding him through the hall is El or Asar, the god Asar. You get it? So his mother is the living principal female mother, which would be all said. And his father is the dead being, the, the lord of the dead or the lord that's in the underworld that's guiding him through his life, through memory, through his subconscious. That's Asar or El. So that's his father. So let's move on. Uh, on the side, you see a picture. You see his father guiding him through the hallway. Well, on the walls, those are the different Aku or the ancestors on the wall. The father being Asar, the principal father deity or Ptah, guiding Haru through the hall of the spiritual world or the subconscious of the mind. Taking him to his duty or his destiny, which is to be this divine angel or divine singer. Remember, the choir master of heaven. Now, we got to deal with the slight depictions where they show uh, uh, previous ancestors that were once uh, into the blues and jazz on the walls of the club and in different areas where Joe may go. Remember, those beings on the wall, those pictures, those icons are the Aku or the ancestors, called the Igungun, but the ascended ancestors in all of the different spiritual systems, right? They call the Rishis, the Aku, they would be the Ophanim and Seraphim in the Hebrew system. They also call Teraphim. The lower forms of them are called Teraphim. But remember, these are ascended ancestors that were once humans that ascended to an angelic state, to the highest of the heavens. And Joe's going through that hall because the intention of the movie is to show that he, meaning your soul, should be able to ascend like Joe into those higher realms of the Aku. And the Aku is an Egyptian concept of an ascended ancestor, a being of light. And in that Brown, they're known and they're depicted to sing these divine songs and be these divine singers. Check. So as above, so below. As within, so without. So that's what the hall depiction represents when you see all of those images. They represent the ancestors, the, the ascended ancestors, not just any ancestors. 
Because we got to understand a lot of the ancestors end up being trapped and reincarnating and staying in this physical dimension or physical world. But there's a very selected few ancestors that's able to ascend and get liberated and enter into the Aru fields or the hall, make it through the hall of the Duat or the hall of Maya. And they're called Aku or Aku. Now, this is going to get to the most interesting part of the whole recording that we're doing. Is what about the blue souls or these blue beings that we see when Joe finally gets in, into, the, into heaven or the spiritual world? I can show this in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, if you look on the side of me, you'll see that these beings are called the Shabdis. Shabdis. And it is symbolic of the Ka or the spirit of the deceased person able to travel and ascend through the Duat and make their passageway to the spiritual world. It's called the Shabdis, and they're symbolic figurines or little statues, miniature statues that are a, a, a mirror or a parallel to the unseen force called the Ka or that spirit traveling through the spiritual world, like I said. So, uh, and I put a depiction of the Ka body that we mentioned earlier. Remember, that's called a Shabdi. The Ka is depicted as blue, holding Horus in his hand. That's the Ka of the soul, the soul being the boy Horus, with you see the Horus lock on the side of his head. Well, that's who Joe represents, that boy. The Ka is those blue beings we see in uh, the spiritual world. Remember, in the Hall of Ma'at or the Duat, they pick Asar as blue. Remember, the goal of all souls is to become in unity or to be united or to enter and return back into the body of Asar, right? Remember, the same as Amun, the god Amun or Amon. Put pictures of our moon so you'll be able to see him. Remember, Osar, Osar or Osiris, who we talked about earlier, is Joe's father, is associated with being blue. And we're going to deal with the significance of that in a minute because you have to understand all of these Aku, these ancestors that are able to ascend and become angelic or angels in the uh, higher planes, they, the goal is for them to return to the body of Osar. And Osar is what? Blue. So you, if you, all of those beings, those Aku, must be what? Blue as well. Traveling through the duat or the spiritual world. Well, those blue beings represent something in the Hindu system called Narayanas and Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha is another word for heaven. So if I show you the pictures on the side of me, look at these images and you'll understand that in those Vaikuntha realms, that's what the soul or the higher expression of your higher self actually appears as it's, as it's depicted in the East, in India, and in amongst Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism as well. So about Vyakunta, let me read this quote for you. It's about one of the only things I'm going to read in this tape, in this recording. But I want to read this for you because this is interesting. It says, the inhabitants of Vyakunta planets, remember Vyakunta means heaven, the heavenly planets, are described as having glowing sky bluish complexion. So they're known to have glowing, not just blue complexion, but, but glowing blue complexion. Okay, it says they are just the age of growing use. Remember, it said they are just the age of growing use. They look like children. So they, they're they glowing, what, blue, but they're, they they seem as if they're just children, right? It says in the Bhagavata, the text speaks of Vaikuntha, adorable to all the worlds, as the highest realm where Vishnu resides. This too is the highest region beyond the world of darkness and samsara. So it's saying it's in the spiritual world. Okay, it's beyond this physical world of darkness and samsara, which represents the will of reincarnation. So it's beyond these worlds, right? It says, okay, it says, this too is the highest region beyond the world of darkness and samsara, the cycle of birth and death. The destination of those who have transcended the three gunas, three gunas means three qualities of reality, three qualities of nature. They have descended, they have transcended above them, even while they are still alive. So even while you're still alive, you transcend the three gunas. Okay, it says, and beyond there, which there is no higher place. So beyond Vaikuntha or those heavenly states where these blue beings are, there is no higher states, right? So that's what the movie is trying to depict. Uh, it says, the peaceful holy men or ascetics who reach that place never return. So those who are able to attain that higher state with these blue beings that we mentioned never return to the physical world again. It's very key about the movie Soul that we're dealing with. We're breaking the science down with what these blue beings are and what that really is trying to uh, uh, portray to you. Uh, it says, the residents of Vaikuntha, remember the residents of heaven, do not have material bodies. So if you notice in the movie, they don't have no material bodies, right? They're glowing bluish. They're not physical or material. It says, but have pure forms. So their forms are what? Pure, not physical and dense, but pure, like light, right? These forms are like that of Vishnu. Vishnu is uh, associated with an original Dravidian Tamil deity named Pirumal or Mal. 
And you have to understand the reason why Vishnu was blue is because he represents an African jet black blue deity that originated amongst the Tamil and even Ethiopia and Egypt, known as Amun, the god Amun. But it says these forms are like that of Vishnu, also known as Narayana. That's the Dravidian or Tamil name, Narayana. And Vishnu is like the Vedic or Aryan. But the point is that deity, if you see the pictures of him, he's blue. So is Amun, so is Asar, and so is other many distinct deities all across uh, every spiritual system. So even in Buddhism, a lot of their bodhisattvas or tathagatas or higher Buddha souls or spirits are known to be depicted as blue, right? So we'll show that. Now, what about the divine children? Soon, as soon as Joe falls from the platform, from the bridge or the uh, ladder, he falls into these different dimensions and he enters into this realm with these divine children. Who are those divine children? Well, those divine children in the spiritual systems and the mythology represents cherubim, you know, cherubs. Cherub or cherubims are known and depicted in many different uh, cultures, especially in America, in uh, Western uh, Europe, as what babies. Well, in the movie, correspond this principle in the movie, and you understand that those children represent these cherubim. But in the Hindu system, remember, if you go to India, in the Hindu system, the Dravidian and Tamil system, they depict these beings as Kumara, Kumaras, and they're known as divine children. And they also help guide the soul as it enters into the spiritual world. Uh, and if you see this image, I showed the, 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 the Vaikuntha beings, which are the blue beings, and the, and the little children, those represent the Kumara who are trying to enter into the gate of the spiritual world. Okay, so the angels in the movie, you'll notice they're always calling each other Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. They call, they call themselves Jerry's, right? They're the ones who preside over these different worlds. Well, that Jerry concept is coming from the root or is a short name of Jeremiel or Jeremiah, right? But Jeremiel, there's an archangel by the name of Jeremiel. You know, and I'll put the references on the side, but research them. Jeremiel, okay, is known to be the angel presiding over death or the dead or the underworld. Jeremio is an angel that joins the Archangel Michael, so he helps Michael. So remember, these Jerry's, they help Joe, and they're impressed by Joe. Remember, Joe is one of the Archangels, right? So it says, Jeremio, the Archangel, helps Michael or joins the Archangel Michael. So remember, Michael, Metatron, or Joel, well, that's Joe. Jeremio is also known to be a guardian angel. That's what these Jerry's are in the movie. They're guardian angels. Okay, so Jeremiah was also known to escort souls from earth to heaven. It's a very key principle. If you read the, the uh, quote that I put, you'll get the details right out of it. Uh, Jeremiah was also known to help souls review their earthly lives. So Jeremiah does all of the roles and depictions that we see in the movie Soul. These Jerry's represent Jeremiah, the archangel Jeremiah. Because remember, all each principle and activity, that's what happens in the mythology with this angel called Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was also known as the gatekeeper of heaven. Jeremiah also watches over and guides the souls of the dead. Very simple. Same role that the Jerry's play in the movie Soul. Now, what are the demons? The demons are the negative thought forms. They're called the Shedim. Shedim means shadow, shadow being, Shedim. Or Shedu, they call Sedu or Shedu amongst the Sumerians and Babylonians. But the Hebrews and the, the biblical narrative, the Judeans, they called it Shedim. And it's also the Sa'ir, which is like goat-like demons. Now, the Shedim is symbolic of the shadows or darkness. Okay, and that shadow or that darkness is what envelops the soul. Remember, the pure blue being, the pure blue uh, beings of light or these souls, it envelops the shadow, envelops and it covers their whole soul. Okay, so the Shedim or these shadow beings, these shadow beings or these negative uh, beings are born out of the uh, covering of the angelic body. Remember, angel and shedim, or angel and demon, is nothing but the higher self versus the lower self. The higher self being the being of light, the lower self being the being that's covered by a shadow or the flesh. And that's what happens to 22 or Sophia in the movie. But remember, that happens to Sophia, the principal goddess in the Gnostic mythology. Sophia is initially in the highest of the spiritual worlds, but she falls because of different uh, events that happen in the myth. And she ends up getting engulfed in this Shedim or these demons and they swallow her inside of the human body. Well, that's what that being, those shadow beings you see, those demons that you see represent. They represent us trapped in here in these physical bodies and not ascending back into the spiritual world. Now, who are the spiritual workers? These are the spiritual workers. These are basically humans who are able to uh, tap in and go into the spiritual world while they're alive, while they're living. Well, who are these spiritual uh, practitioners and divine beings that are in human bodies?
that are able to tap in through meditation and other practices. Well, they represent the sages, the saints, which would also be your seraphim in the Hebrew system, but they also represent your rishis, right? Your rishis in India and in, in the Hindu system. The Dravidians and Tamilians called them siddhas, right? Siddhas or divine beings, right? These divine beings, these rishis. Now remember, they, they represent beings who can see their seers. They're able to see into the spiritual world. So that's who those spiritual workers are, those spiritual guys who are still humans but able to go into the spiritual world while they're alive. Okay, so now the ship, you got to deal with the ship. The ship that, like I said, Tahuti, or he's called Moonwin, drives in the spiritual world that he's guiding and using to gather souls in the spiritual world and help souls. With so what is that ship? That ship in the mythology is the solar bark. It's called the uh, boat of Ray or the ship of Ray, but it's called the solar bark. Heru uses it as well. And you'll notice the beings that's on that boat it's blue. And you'll notice, you'll see Tahuti, Heru, all those different beings that's in the movie is on that boat. So that's why I broke it down through the characters like I did to show you that they're all presiding over this same ship, the same boat that travels through the underworld of the Duat, which is the subconscious mind. But it also translates in this parallel to the spiritual world. Okay, so now we're going to deal with the seven chakras of the chakras in the movie. The seven chakras, if you notice, on the soul... On each one of these souls, these little blue beings, they have these little uh, earth passes. They call earth passes or patches. These patches have seven different principal uh, objects on them. And each one of those seven objects represents the seven chakras. You get it? So they can't enter into the spirit. They can't enter into the physical world out of the spiritual world until they're able to complete and attain the full body of those seven. Because they represent uh, five bodies or seven different bodies of the human uh, essence. And they can't enter into the physical world until they complete that. And those are the seven they're going to use to, to migrate and navigate in the material world. Because remember, like I said, they're the chakras. So that's your seven chakras on the chest, the patch on those uh, souls in the movie. So one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the movie does mention chakras. So it's not me just alluding to it. The chakras are mentioned. I think you mentioned the crown chakra. So the very fact that the movie mentions that concept. You can see that a lot of the spiritual elements that I'm going into is alluded to in the movie. Now, if you notice on the cover of this movie, this picture of the movie uh, Soul, you'll see it shows 14 keys that Joe is walking on, that he's, he's walking on. Remember, that's the ladder as well. But remember, that, that represents the 14 lokas, seven higher and seven lower. So according to the Hindu system, there's 14 different chakras in our body. The higher, one, the higher ones, which is from the head, to your uh, the bottom of your behind basically and it's the chakras from your behind to your feet to your feet so that's 14 chakras they also correspond to 14 worlds called lokas well in the depiction of the cover of the movie those are 14 keys which represents the 14 worlds the 14 vibrations of sound but also the 14 chakras inside of joe's body joe symb symbolizes climbing those keys playing those keys and climbing to the, to the chief and top key which would be the crown chakra, which would symbolically represent the soul ascending into the spiritual world. When you see the event where Joe falls into the pit in the middle of the street, that represents Joe falling into the underworld, which represents the subconscious, your subconscious mind. Because remember, while he's alive, he's all uh, enjoying life and, and happy and uh, excited about what's about to happen, but then he falls into the subconscious or the underworld. The underworld, and remember, they, they depict him dying. His soul departing, right? And he, his soul now trying to understand where, where it's at. Well, that represents the subconscious on the underworld. So remember, the kingdom of heaven is within. So I'm going to show some depictions of that. They show a scene where people go into what they call the flow. And that flow state puts them into a trance in a divine state of intoxication, spiritual intoxication. And their, their blue bodies appear in the astral or spiritual world. Well, remember, all of this is going on inside of their bodies, inside of their bodies. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is within. You can tap into it, just like the movie is depicting, through that flow state. Okay, there's a certain scene in the movie where these beings turn into little balls and they ascend into that big orb or that big ball of light, that big sphere of light. Well, those little balls represent neurons in our brains. Remember, as above, so below. So they also represent stars in the spiritual world or stars in the heavenly realm. So that's why these souls turn into little orbs and they ascend as photons back into that being of light. That being of light is a star. But remember, as above, so below, inside of Joe's body, that would represent a neuron inside of his brain. You get it? So they're ascending what to the kingdom of heaven. As, as above, so below. As within, so without. 
And remember, we talked about the Vaikuntha realms of heaven and the Hindu mythology, the Dravidian mythology. Well, they're depicted on a side. And you can see them. those are the same spheres. That's what they symbolize. They're different worlds that's made up of beings of light, these balls of light, which is symbolic as within, so without, as neurons in our own brain and Joel's body. Okay, so to bring this to a close, the reason why this movie is significant, the best thing we can bring out of this is you have to understand, okay, we have to understand they try to depict the spiritual practitioners and how they're able to enter and see and experience their spiritual world while they still were alive. Now, Joe had no knowledge of this previously, but they show you Moonwind and these different group of people with them, these masters, these spiritual practitioners, they're able to pierce into the spiritual world and experience it. Remember, for all those who view this video, subscribe because the point is we're trying to gather all of these different distinct minds, the same people have the same capabilities, have that same motivation that that group did in the movie, like I said, that's following Moonwind. Because remember, we got to understand that that movie may be fantasy, it may be fiction, but it's trying to show you symbolically that may be concretely real in our real experience, our real world. And I can be able to guide you on this channel to show you and lead you step by step of how the different principles in the movie are actually concrete and real. They have a real ancient reference in different cultures. We went through Egypt, we went through India, we went through Greece, we went through the Hebrew system. We can go to all the spiritual systems in the world. They all deal with, in a serious way, these concepts in this movie. But the point is, the bigger bulk of society is distracted. But I wanted to show and make this a point that Moonwind is able to successfully help Joe transmigrate and attain these different levels in the spiritual world. So if that's your same goal, you need to connect here. You need to subscribe and link in and we'll collect these different individuals and we'll get to that same mission and that same motivation to do what? To guide our souls to the spiritual world. We have to be able to prove and substantiate and bring our energies together and, and be able to realize in a conclusive way, is those spiritual worlds real or not? We need to have the platform to be able to do that. So if you're about that type of motivation, that type of intention, that type of mind, Subscribe here and we'll work on that agenda. I'll go ahead and end this and remember That's basically the full breakdown of the movie called soul. It's a symbolic metaphysical fantasy Tale that's put in a cartoon form that's supposed to explain to you and express to you The journey of the soul into the spiritual world